I want to thank everyone for coming. My name's uh, Jason Bordoff. I'm a professor at Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. I direct the Center on Global Energy Policy there. And today, we're going to be discussing the medium-term outlook for the global natural gas markets. Uh, first, uh, let me just quickly say, like all center events, this is being webcast live. Both the full video and the audio podcast recording will be available on our website and on iTunes and other platforms in the next several days. For those of you watching online or those of you here in the room as well, you can ask a question for the panelists anytime using our hashtag CGEP events and our Twitter handle at Columbia U Energy. So, uh, so now uh, turn it over to our speaker, K Costanza Jacasio, who joined the International Energy Agency in November 2014, uh, where she is responsible for all things natural gas, uh, as well as other areas uh, as senior gas expert um, in the gas, coal, and power division. Prior to that, she was head of macro and fuel anal analysis at uh, Fortum, a large utility in the Nordics, um, and also worked for many years uh, at Barclays Capital Commodities Research team between 2006 and 2011, and pre prior to that, a gas economist at BP from 2004 to 2006. So she's been studying the gas market and doing gas analysis for a long time. Uh, the IEA was lucky to have her join the team not long ago, and, and uh, I'm really delighted she's here at Columbia today, given how dramatically and how quickly things in the gas market are changing. The first ever export of US LNG from the lower 48, uh, significant increases in international global gas trade, largely coming out of the US and Australia in the medium term, uh, but also advances in renewables, changes in the coal uh, sector, uh, and the outlook for nuclear, all of which will affect both supply and demand for natural gas, a lot of moving parts, and that's what we're gonna talk about for the next hour. So please join me in welcoming Costanza to Columbia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. <clears throat> All right, thank you very much for being here. Um, I will spend the next 20 minutes or so to give you a picture of the key messages of the medium term gas market report that, of course, you can, uh, you can buy a download from the IA website if you'd like more, uh, more insight on, on the topic. Um, the first message that I'd like to, uh, to show is um, surrounding gas demand. And uh, we do expect over the next uh, five years, global gas demand growth to slow uh, significantly. Between 2009 and 2015, global gas demand grew by around 2.5% annually. We now expect growth to be around 1.5% annually over the next six years. Um, we revised down our forecast compared to last year's forecast by uh, half a percentage point, which basically mean around 100, 100, uh, 20 uh, BCM uh, per year. Now, there are two key reasons for this revision and this slowdown. The first one is primary energy growth in general is lowing. So it's not just about gas, but it's about fossil fuels in general. Uh, the energy and economic transformation of China, the uh, decline in uh, um, uh, the decline in the energy intensity of the world economy, the significant slowdown in economic growth from energy intensive economies such as Russia and the Middle East are all combining to actually slow primary energy uh, demand growth. So because coal demand and oil demand also weakens, we actually expect gas to still maintain or increase slightly share in the primary energy mix. The second reason is instead much more gas specific and is linked to the difficulty the gas has to compete in the power generation sector in an environment of very cheap coal on the one hand and falling cost and continuous support for renewables on the other. So low gas prices so far has not been able to offset, offset these factors, reason why we do still see uh, this, uh, this demand weakness. Now, if we do look at uh, and we take a regional perspective, we do see some substantial dynamics in the composition of growth over the next five years. So this is a growth in BCM between 2009 and 15 from different countries or regions, the major ones driving demand growth. And this is what we expect for um, the next five. And there are a number of things that we could discuss, but I'd like to focus on two points. The number one, and we do expect China to continue to uh, drive uh, global gas demand growth and to consolidate the, its position as a key demand drivers. 
Uh, this might seem somewhat contradictory with what we have witnessed in 2015, when gas demand growth in China slowed to its lowest pace since 1998. So, of course, there are question marks surrounding whether China can deliver all that growth. But we believe there are some <coughs> factors, um, some factors which have impacted demand growth in 2015 in China are temporary, and mainly is linked to the fact the gas has lost a lot of competitiveness versus oil in the industrial sector. In a market where domestic prices in China for oil are adjusted almost immediately with the uh, international benchmarks, while gas, uh, domestic gas prices in China are adjusted much more infrequently, and so were cut just once in 2015. Um, LPG demand in China last year skyrocketed. So we do expect with a bottoming up out of oil prices on the one hand, with a sharp cut in domestic gas prices on the other, this loss of competitiveness to basically unwind and for gas to recover some demand in the industrial sector. On the other hand, I think market, um, market sentiment toward China might have turned a little bit too pessimistic uh, due to all the improvements uh, in terms of environmental policies that China is, is implementing. I think the experience of Beijing does really show what, uh, uh, what environmental policies and coal to gas substitution in China can do. Beijing gas demand has doubled over the, uh, since 2010, and in 2015 actually drove, I think, almost 40% of the incremental gas demand in China. So to the extent that this can extend to other cities, even in an environment where the macroeconomic outlook is relatively weak, and when the heavy industry in China is lowering markedly, I think there is space for gas to actually uh, actually um, grow relatively healthy. So we project growth of around 9% per year, which of course is lower than 15% per annum over the prior six years, but is substantially higher than what uh, experienced in 2015. The other key thing for me is the outlook for the United States. So between 2009-2015, US gas demand grew, uh, I would say, very strongly, but in terms of BCM, certainly. Um, we do expect much slower growth over the next six years, and this is really driven by the power sector dynamics. Um, so in the power sector, we expect the US to witness something that we in Europe have already experienced, which is a substantial slower growth of demand growth, electricity generation growth on the one hand, and a substantial growth from low carbon sources, which will outpace the growth of total um, uh, electricity generation growth. So we expect growth of around 150 terawatt hour for total generation between 2015 and 2021, but we expect a contraction in thermal generation of around 100 terawatt hours. This, of course, I mean coal plus gas. So of course, the closure of coal capacity will leave some space for gas to increase, um, to take take some space, but at the same time there will be a much smaller pie for thermal generation growth in total, which we think we, uh, will result in stagnation in gas demand in the power sector for the next six years. If we do look at the European Union, we expect demand to stabilize. This also will be a major shift compared to the previous six years. The retirement of coal capacity and the some retirement of nuclear start to impact uh, again, give some space for uh, gas fire generation to return. At the same time, a carbon um, price floor in the UK is making gas um, economics versus coal once again in that particular country, and this will help to, uh, to sort of generate some growth. Now, I would like to point out that by 2021, EU gas demand will still be 13% below what it was in 2007 pre-financial crisis. So it's really stabilization rather than a substantial increase. In Korea and Japan as well, we expect major changes. Korea and Japan um, accounted for the decent amount of growth between 2009 and 2015. This had major implication for LNG markets as I will talk to you, will illustrate in a minute. 
between 2015 and 2021, we expect actually demand combined from these two countries to decline. Now, this of course is very sensitive to the forecast for nuclear generation capacity. We have an expectation of 15 gigawatt to come back by 2021. If that doesn't come, of course, Korea and Japan together will grow. But Japan by itself, in terms of coal of an LNG market, coal on LNG imports, most likely has peaked even in environment of no return of nuclear capacity from current levels. So this is substantially different picture compared to the growth uh, dynamics of the prior six years. Now, if we look at the production side, um, maybe things are not as dramatic on the demand side, but there are some in interesting changes ongoing as well. So United States and Australia combined are expected to account for more than half of global gas demand growth. Uh, and we are going to see a substantial uh, smaller growth from traditional important exporters such as Qatar, Russian, and ASEAN. Their share, the combined share of growth between 2009 and 2015 was roughly one-third, 30%. Now it's going to be closer to 5%. Of course, there are different reasons determining why these countries are not putting so much gas onto the market anymore. For Qatar, it's clearly a choice due to the moratorium that they have on the uh, field expansion and LNG capacity expansion. For Russia, it's really the weakness of domestic markets and most important expo markets, Europe and former uh, Soviet Union states. For ASEAN, it's really a matter of the inability of production to grow fast enough to uh, you know, meet domestic demand and export as well. So we expect Indonesian and Malaysian production combined to basically be flat. And then we have smaller markets, such as Thailand and Philippines, where production does start to decline. So the region clearly is seeing some substantial shifts. When it comes to the European Union, we expect the downtrend in production to continue. Of course, again, in Europe as well, there will be a huge amount of uncertainty depending on the policy decisions on Groningen. In this outlook, we assume Groningen production to stay at the same level of the most recent cap. So it does limit the additional fall in, uh, in, uh, in production. But of course, if uh, Groningen production caps will be adjusted downwards, uh, I mean, European production will decline faster. So what about the US zooming in on, on US production? Um, we basically expect U.S. production growth to stagnate in 2016, uh, recover very modestly in 2017, basically driven by falling associated gas production and slower growth elsewhere. Now, because of our expectation of the IA of rebalancing oil markets and gradually increasing uh, price uh, you know, to, through 2021, I think the heavy lifting of improving the economic of, of gas production will be made by, uh, by oil. So with moderate increases in, in prices, you might well be able to regenerate a substantial amount of growth post-2018 as, as you know, the oil markets start to, start to rebalance. So despite this slowdown in 2016 and 2017, we expect U.S. gas production to still account for one-third of global production growth uh, through 2021. Now, an interesting point is that uh, most of the growth compared with the prior six years will actually go to feed exports rather than domestic demand. So what's going to happen to external markets, I think, will have a substantial impact uh, back on uh, U.S. Uh, gas production dynamics, or certainly more so than it did over the prior, um, over the prior six years. So, so this is just showing the overall combined trend. <clears throat> so, what does this mean for, um, for 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 other markets? And one of other key takeaway of the report uh, is that Europe will start to experience a substantial amount of competition much greater than has traditionally experienced. Now, in the past, uh, uh, the oversupply in LNG markets has traditionally been met with Europe absorbing unwanted LNG and LNG supplies. I think this partially might still be the case, but because of the slowdown in uh, um, or the, the anemic growth in European gas demand on the one hand, very cheap coal on the other, and so, uh, you know, limited amount of substitution potential at relatively high gas prices, 
um, and you know the competition from Russian gas, um, the the potential for Europe to take all the extra LNG supplies uh, that Asia doesn't take or other regions don't take might be somewhat limited. So this will basically mean that we are going to see competition between um, US supplies or Qatari supplies uh, and Russian supplies to gain or maintain access to the European market. Now, we just consider the US capacity, which is under construction, for which we can consider that a good chunk of the capital cost is a sunk cost. Currently, US gas is economic into Europe at a price close to $4 per million BTU, which is below the current forward curve for TTF prices, the current spot TTF prices. Now, of course, this will put pressure on other uh, producers to uh, potentially becoming more flexible in their pricing strategy if they do want to maintain the market share, as often has been stated um, in, in, uh, in official documents of, of, of uh, strategy document of Gazprom, for example. Uh, we are already seeing some changes in pricing behavior on the part of Gazprom. We have seen auctions being conducted. We had seen um, uh, some important renegotiation of contracts with major buyers at the beginning of the year. So, there are some signs that Gazprom might become more flexible in its price strategy to uh, sort of uh, defend market share. Whether that will be the case uh, when uh, you know, 80 BCM of US capacity come on the market does remain to be seen, but certainly there are some signals. From a EU consumer perspective, this probably is going to be a quite positive dynamics which will bring more competition and probably um, more uh, you know, fundamentally priced gas into the European market. When it comes to LNG, um, we are going to see a substantial increase in new liquefaction capacity over the next six years. We expect a growth of 45%, uh, roughly 190 BCM. Um, most of it comes from Australia and the US. This is a well-known fact. Most of it has already been committed, um, has you know, capacity reservation contract for the US, a long-term contract for other, other, other projects good chunk of the capital cost has been incurred, so the execution of this project probably will continue um, more or less unchanged despite the very low uh, price environment. Um, so we do expect this to bring more connectivity to the markets um, and you know, somehow help in, in creating more, um, more linkages in pricing dynamics across different regions. Where does demand come from? Who will take all the supplies? So this is shows how um, LNG imports have changed between 2009 and 2015, um, and this shows how we do expect uh, uh, you know, LNG imports to, to change. So who is going to take all this incremental demand? I think there are a number of things that are important to highlight. One, Korea and Japan together, which have accounted for 45% of the incremental imports between 2009 and 2015, will now decline or stay flat, of course, depending on your own assumptions on nuclear capacity. In our assumption, they decline by a combined, I think, around 10 BCM. So that is going to create major, uh, major space for others, or if you want in a heavy oversupply market, create challenge for all these supplies to be absorbed. Um, we expect substantial growth from China and India. I think this is a big, in a sense, bet, if you want, of the report. We expect lower prices to stimulate demand in uh, price-sensitive countries. Um, again, I would highlight that if China doesn't grow at 9%, as is a baseline assumption, and there is a lot of risk surrounding what the actual rate of growth for Chinese demand might be, then China imports might actually not increase at all if demand stay at 5% as we experienced in 2015. So I think there are some, of course, risks surrounding whether China can indeed absorb all this extra LNG, very much dependent on your own view on how gas to coal substitution in China and coal policy in China might work. But in our baseline scenario, we do expect <coughs> this to occur. Even so, even so, we have 30 BCM of gas that will flow to Europe between 2015 and 2021. So again, that goes back to my original uh, statement of this, this is a, the stent of the price of competition that Europe might did see between now and 2021. 
And despite that, we still expect liquefaction plants utilization to actually run below capacity. So the, these charts basically illustrate what is our own estimate of actual utilization. So we took off um, things uh, such as, you know, Angola plants out for technical issues, Yemen plants out for uh, other issues. So it's just like, and also we made assumptions on feed gas issues. So this is the actual economic utilization of a plant that is there and can run because has fit gas gas and technically can operate. So of course, capacity rates were very, very high, like 5% downtime maintenance is quite common. But we do expect that if capacity from the liquefaction side come online on track, then utilization will need to be economically constrained over the next couple of years due to the overall slowdown in demand. Then we expect that to start to recover, so market to start to balance, but we don't expect the market to be as tight as it was in 11 or 12, even by 2021. Um, now, to just quickly, um, you know, you know, put some risks factors and, you know, what could go wrong, what, what could change this sort of outlook. I think there is something to notice which has been a growing trend of capacity being offline over the past five years. So between 2011 and 2015, because of feed gas, because of security issues, because of technical issues, the you know, capacity offline went from 20 BCM to 55 BCM. In the environment of sustained low and gas prices, I think risks that something can go wrong in terms of fit gas not being there or something to be taken out uh, of the market is actually increasing rather than decreasing. So that is something very difficult to predict, but I think it's some sort of uh, um, risk assessment that should be considered when looking at uh, what could rebalance the market faster than, for example, what we are assuming in our baseline. And this just shows the implications for investments, which is my last slide, and I'd like to uh, give some food for thoughts on how the market beyond 2021 could actually develop. Now, over the past four years, we did see around 35 BCM of capacity annually being sanctioned for new projects. 2015 already saw that decline to around 25 BCM. As prices started to slow, um, and also it's to note that the vast majority of what was sanctioned in 2015 was actually underpinned by long-term contract signed well ahead of 2015. It's mainly US, uh, US plans for which capacity reservation contracts were already in place. And of course, 2016 to date, I should say to the beginning of June, we haven't seen uh, new FID uh, at all. Um, so clearly there is a huge uh, uh, implications for investment as this price, uh, uh, this price levels. If price levels stay at this level, I think it would be very difficult to see substantial new capacity additions coming coming online. So this really opened the question on how market 2021, 2025 might balance out amid slower demand growth on the one hand, but a complete collapse of investment on the others. So I think that's all for me, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you, Costanza. That was uh, covered a lot of information there. Um, really appreciate your doing that. So uh, let me ask a couple of questions and then we'll open it up uh, to the audience. Um, I think it was five years ago, the IEA put out a report, The Golden Age of Gas. Yeah. Um, so when you, uh, went and, and your boss, Fatih Barol, the head of the IEA, commented recently, maybe the Golden Age of Gas had stalled. So when you look at the medium and longer term outlook, can you help us understand how it looks today versus what it might have looked like five years ago? And do you think the golden age of gas has stalled and why? So um, I always like to reemphasize that there was a question mark to that phrase, <laughs> the golden age of gas, but uh, the question mark has gone in everybody's mind. Um, compared to what was forecast in that report, um, indeed demand is overall um, perform less well, but I would say not as badly as many think, uh, due to the fact that actually demand growth in the US outperformed substantially what was the forecast back then in 2011. So I would say the US has experienced an extraordinary golden age of gas, while the rest of the world has, has not, in a sense. I think what has changed is that, um, you know, just a few years ago, um, companies and analysts were 
operating from the assumption that Asia would have taken whatever quantity of gas at whatever price. So the vast majority of new projects have been done with in mind Asia markets as a destination market. Now, what 2012, 2013 taught us is that gas demand in emerging markets is actually much more price sensitive than we thought it was. So the key question and the key area of disappointment, in a sense, in growth has been Asia markets. Of course, in Europe, we did have all these issues around the impact of renewables and the gas fire generation. But if we think strategically for a 25 project, what actually has led uh, many to take the decision has been the effort for Asia market. So if we look going forward, uh, the key question for me is whether the industry can deliver gas at a price which is seen as competitive enough, which doesn't mean to be perfectly competitive with coal on an energy equivalent million BTU basis, but whether it can be perceived as cheap, abundant, and secure enough for Asian countries to make long-term decisions in terms of environmental policies, in terms of energy mixed, based on, on gas. And I think we are just, you know, going through a very strong cycle, so it's very difficult to actually forecast whether that's going to occur or not. Uh, but if we do stay in a relatively low price environment for long enough with an expectation that that is at least partially sustainable, then I think gas demand in this emerging market might indeed grow. And how big an impact is policy going to have on, on that? I think policy is critical uh, because uh, um, I would argue that for me at least uh, the number one risk factor for gas demand globally is coal policy in China in a sense. I mean, 1% change in coal fire generation in China is equivalent of <coughs> two big LNG trains. So give you a sense of you know, what is a sort of delta, if you want to put it, that you can have with uh, um, you know, strong environmental policy. Other things that are comparison that we always talk about, the IEA is, you know, an estimated 700 million ton of coal in uh, decentralized boilers. So we're not talking about power generation currently utilized in China. Uh, that's on, again, on an energy equivalent basis, it's, you know, another LNG markets, you know, 350 BCM of gas. So even if you can convert just some of that to gas in a country where gas account for a very small portion of the energy mix in general, then will give you a huge amount of growth potential. So the growth potential is there. The question is whether policy can deliver, and I think policy will be more easily deliver if gas prices are relatively low. And so just staying on policy for a minute, one of the things the slides didn't um, cover too much is sort of thinking about Paris Climate Agreements, the INDCs, a 450 scenario. Um, can you talk about the, what, what that would all mean for natural gas and this idea of gas as a bridge fuel? Does that make sense to you? Um, you know, before the Paris Agreement we published, I, I'm sure that you remember the things called the bridge scenario, which was looking at measures which could uh, um, basically give us a, an early peak in emission. Um, and then are like a number of measures, and I always go through them to sort of trying to figure out what the impact of strong policy uh, post Paris might have on gas. And you can see things that are positive and things that are negative for gas. That's why it's so difficult to actually um, precisely pinpoint what the outlook for gas in the post 2020 world might be. Of course, we are going to see um, phase out of inefficient coal. That is one of the measures that we emphasize, and I think implementation of Paris <coughs> might actually bring us there, uh, which of course will create space for other things, and part of them probably will be gas. So that will create some space for gas. At the same time, we will need to have an enormous uh, improvement in energy efficiency, which will push down demand for primary energy in general, and ov obviously having feedback effects on gas. And partly this is already something we can observe in how um, electricity generation growth has behaved in uh, advanced economies. In Japan put huge amount of demand side measures post Fukushima. In Europe demand growth is flattening, in the US uh, is flattening as well, 
partly due also to energy efficiency measures. So as that trend um, sort of intensify, all the amount for fossil fuel will go down and that will have impact for gas as well. Um, I think gas, if again, uh, can be produced relatively competitively, has an important role to play in association with renewable. I mean, make a huge difference whether gas is $15 per million BTU or whether gas is $7 per million BTU. Particularly where you think about emerging markets where there is a lot of new coal capacity uh, currently being built. So, of course, in developed markets, what actually is happening is we are trying to completely change the energy mix of the country. We don't need new capacity. We just want to change the mix. In emerging countries where electricity demand, in fact, is on the rise, if you can have a relatively low price in an environment where renewable costs go down, you indeed can have a combination of renewables and gas which can be, in effect, almost cost competitive with coal. But again, the price issues get get very important. I think generally, you know, gas will we, we will have an important role to play in association with renewable, but it's not the only thing that can play in association with renewables, and therefore the price again, I think, does matter quite a lot. Yeah, and so I mean, we had done some work recently at the Energy Center looking um, at the impact of policies in the U.S., like the ex renewable tax credit extensions through as part of the deal for oil exports, which um, which which. Give, gas takes a hit in response to that because right. renewables uh, are lower cost. Also, what the market would be for U.S. LNG overseas, and as you said, there's still there still is an arbitrage, there still yes. is a window, but in your charts it looked small. So the difference between even four dollar and five dollar, nevertheless seven and fifteen, uh, in the U.S. makes a big difference. Yes. Is that right? That, yeah, that's yeah. Also, absolutely. It does make a does make a big difference. Of course, you know that's we're just price based on the forward curve. But my point is that. Um, that's something that Europe, getting a European perspective, has never really experienced. So in a sense, there was now something as some sort of supply available in the short term at the $4 premium BTU basis or $5 premium BTU basis. And in the long term, of course, depends what your assumptions on you know, long-run costs are. But that could pose a sort of ceiling, in a sense, to mm -hmm. what can be delivered in Europe at what prices. The dramatic declines we've seen in renewable costs, yes. how big an impact has that had on the outlook in the, from the EIA over the last year or two? I think that has a big impact um, because, first of all, lower the cost of policies. Uh, so again, I, I think I, from my pers perspective, policy have a cost. Uh, so of course you can implement very expensive policy, but then become difficult to maintain them. As cost goes down, policy support is still needed for more renewable to be deployed, but the cost has gone down. And so they make that deployment easier. So in that sense, this, uh, this is an important factor. I would say the tax credits in the US has been one of the major uh, changes um, in our assumptions in this gas uh, report with respect to impact for renewables. And that's why, as you also have pointed out, we do see this dramatic drop in gas demand growth. Um, but that certainly are having an impact, and we see you know, renewables popping up <laughs> in various countries, and we do keep seeing uh, new auctions at prices uh, increasingly uh, lower. So that's it's eating at the margin into the demand for gas as well. You yeah. said um, a, lot, uh, a lot of the growth in U.S. gas production would be for exports, not yes. for domestic consumption, and much more of that would be going to Europe than we might have thought a couple of years ago, given how the market has changed. How will Gazprom respond? That's, uh, you know, everybody's question. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm not Gazprom, so I don't know what Gazprom <laughs> will do. Um, my, what I think we can certainly say is that in reaction to um, you know, new supplies potentially coming to Europe, the past 12 months has shown uh, some changes in uh, Gazprom, uh, I wouldn't call it strategy, but some changes in pricing behavior. Um, there was these auctions which were done for the first time uh, by Gazprom is looking potentially to sell some gas on auctions. There were like two important negotiations at the beginning of the years, one with uh, ENG, one with Uniper. Um, so there is a sense that there might become more flexible in pricing the gas. Now, again, we haven't seen much US gas flowing to Europe yet. Uh, in fact, much of it has not flown into Europe. 
So it's very difficult to draw long-term conclusions based on very few data points. Um, so we are now going to see, I don't know, 85 BCM of new you know, uh, LNG capacity been hitting the market from the US between now and 2021, so we will have to be seen. Now, Gazprom has in various strategy documents stated that he uh, has a strategy to defend a certain level of market share in Europe. So to that extent, that's if that will not change, then price of Russian gas will need to be priced in a competitive manner <coughs> if US gas can be delivered in Europe at $4 per million BTU. So let, let me, um, when you look at the medium term through 2021 and you talk about the gas market, the word glut gets used a lot. There's yes. a lot of supply coming in from the U.S. and Australia and elsewhere. Um, I know you're here just to talk about 2021, but yes. let me ask you to look yes. a little bit further sure. ahead um, because there is, if we see a significant cutback in capital investment today, uh, there are some who believe looking out toward 2025 that you know around that time the market could actually tighten up quite a bit given the lack of new supply that might come into the market and if demand continues to grow. Do you think we're setting ourselves up for that sort of underinvestment cycle? And do we need, and it takes seven, eight, nine years to build these LNG plants, do we need that investment to continue to be going on today despite the near term or medium term glut we might have? Yeah, it's possible. I'm very lucky that somebody else in the IEA is looking at 2030, <laughs> so they have a difficult task to answer precisely the questions on a you know, BCM perspective. Um, the more, of course, we stay in this low price environment, the less is going to come online. At these current prices, it's tough to see anything going through. Maybe some small plants will go through, but in terms of new base load capacity going through. I think also there is a substantial change in expectation from the buying side in terms of what they are ready to commit to. So it's not just a matter of prices, it's also a matter of what your customers want in an environment where there is an increased sense that the dynamics might change a lot, uh, particularly if oil prices goes back up in a situation where liquefaction capacity might need to be constrained. It might be difficult for buyers to commit to 25 years contracts based on all linkages. So there will be a lot that need to be rethought uh, in terms of you know, how deals and how uh, uh, contracts get signed. There is also an increasing shift between um, who actually is the buyer of LNG. I mean, if you believe to what we write, which I do, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, Japan will might not be, Japan and Korea might not be have so much additional long-term base load demand. So you might need to go and start to chase customers such as Pakistan, such as Egypt. Uh, such as potentially Philippines, Vietnam. So this does create another sort of sort of challenges. So, y you know, I think because of also this complete shift in who is buying <coughs> LNG, that might also delay further how long it's going to take for contracts to be signed, for investment to go through. So it's certainly possible that if we do stay in, let's say, three years with very low uh, very low investments, and if gas cost of new projects come down a bit, so as demand start to recover, by 2025 or post 2025, we might indeed be in a tighter market again. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the balances myself to actually, uh, you know, answer. But I think this is a real risk. Uh, it so certainly is a risk. A couple of years ago, there was also a lot of focus on the Asian gas price. Yes. When it was $18, $20 per million BTU, much lower now, so a little less focus on that. But this idea that it, we, we, would, we would move toward a pricing formula that reflected supply and demand for that commodity rather than uh, the price of oil, um, is that, do you see that happening? What's the yes. outlook for Asian gas pricing? I think uh, we are going to have a very strong reemergence of tensions between oiling prices and hub prices. Because, of course, over the past two years, we have pretty much hub prices and holding prices being trading at a very similar level. Now, because of IA expectation of it tightening back of the old market, because we expect the old market to tighten back well ahead of global <coughs> gas markets will, that, of course, will create uh, you know, increased tensions between uh, you know, old classical linkage model and hub prices. Whether the tension will be enough to be transformational in how the market works, I don't know. 
but clearly I see that re-emerging as the major issue by the late, uh, later this decade. Um, and also, again, going back to my initial point, because who buy LNG will change, the new customers might indeed be much less willing to sign long-term contract or length for 25 years, particularly where they don't know what their demand level is. In Egypt, for example, we have new discoveries which might indeed impact how much and for how long Egypt will import LNG. Similar considerations can be made for a number of countries also in Latin America where there is a lot of fluctuations in hydro. So the entire way um, this traditional long-term oil linkage uh, model work might be, I would say, you know, questionable, will be questionable again. I think over the past two years was relatively easy because everything was priced pretty much at the same time. But by 2020, I do think that tension will emerge. So, and with all these changes in the gas market becoming more interconnected, more trade, a lot of opportunities, but maybe some risks as well. One of the mandates that IEA member countries have given to the IEA is to think about uh, security issues for the gas market in the way the IEA for decades has thought yes. about security risks in the oil market. Can you talk a little bit about what the questions are that the IEA is thinking about when it comes to security of supply for gas? Yeah, I mean, of course, there are like, a number of different questions. One of them I, for example, highlighted uh, in my slides in terms of how much capacity is actually off market. I mean, there is a tendency to look at capacity always in gross terms. Whatever still is in the ground, that it's capacity, and then you base your forecast based on that. But indeed, what we have seen has been a growing trend for capacity not being running. And I think there are a number of countries which have capacity which can almost be considered as trended. Um, you know, we have utilization levels for capacity in Algeria, perhaps in the 50%. Now it's questionable whether if prices go to $25 per million BTU, Algeria might be able to actually utilize 95% of the capacity. And you, you can actually see a variety of countries we do experience that. And the trend has been a deteriorating trend rather than improving trend. So that's, for example, is one of the things that we look at very closely. Of course, also the impact of investments in the long term is something we look at very closely. How the uncertainty over the long term demand outlook, partly due to policy, or we we'll say mainly due to policy, might indeed um, hinder uh, new investment decisions which will have an important impact uh, getting into uh, you know, late in the 20s. Um, also in terms of how different countries might be able to respond to temporary or prolonged supply shortages, how resilient their own system is, how this gas system itself is changing in an environment where renewables are taking a bigger role. Because of course that change the way gas is deployed, change potentially the way um, you know, gas might be bought or the ideal business model to buy gas to respond to sort of a much more intermittent demand dispatch. So these are all sort of topics that we are looking at when we do discuss uh, gas security. And just quickly, I mean, we'll open it up. Do you see um, shale outside the US playing any meaningful role in supply? Um, by by 2021, uh, my answer would be no. My probably is the easier answer. <laughs> um, in fact, if anything, over the past couple of years, we have seen um, a weaker growth outlook for shale gas in China than previously expected. Um, so, you know, by 2021, I think we have a forecast of around 20 BCM of gas in uh, in China from shale. That's if you go back a couple of years, initially <coughs> the government target itself was 60 BCM, so that has been gone down from a government side, but also in terms of our forecast. Outside that, of course, the big question is Argentina. Uh, we did um, hold our unconventional gas forum in Argentina this year. I think long term, there are like very good prospects. Um, I mean, Argentina has a lot of positive things, apparently very good geology. It's a gas country, infrastructure is there, but perceptionally the costs are still relatively high. So it might take some time for new investors experimenting with the geology for 
cost to come down to a level where it might indeed be economic to develop it, particularly consider the fact that you are currently in a market which is oversupply, where LNG is priced at $5 per million BTU. So I think that will basically mean that it will take some time for Argentina to, to bring their resources uh, online. But in the very long term, yes, we do expect uh, generally Shell to still be an important component of the incremental supply picture. Great. Um, so let's uh, just again, for those watching online or, or listening uh, online, we're here with Costanza Chicasio, who leads the international the gas work at the International Energy Agency, discussing the medium term outlook for gas. Um, let's open it up. If people have questions, please raise your hand. We'll bring a microphone to you and please introduce yourself and keep your question brief. Hi, uh, Judah Aber, thank you for your uh, presentation. Very interesting. Um, question about uh, US uh, coal and the shift from US coal to, um, uh, to natural gas. Uh, I'd be curious uh, a little bit more detail about um, your thoughts on clean power plan and how that might impact the shift over to natural gas and how the new US, uh, uh, the upcoming US election might impact your forecast as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I will uh, let Jason to answer the questions about uh, elections, which probably can answer much better than I do. Um, but in terms of uh, um, switching, in our forecast, uh, our, um, the main uh, um, change compared to last year um, and the main driver for renewable growth up to 2021 is being the change in tax credits. So we do expect that to be by far the bigger change in the medium term outlook when it comes to uh, deployment of renewable and therefore impact on gas. Post 2020, of course, the clean power plant will be the major driver. But in terms of driving our own forecast for the, past, uh, for the outlook and the period that I'm looking at, um, tax credits has been by far the major driver. Um, the questions about how coal to gas switching will play out. It's, for us, very difficult to answer in a very granular manner because it really depends from the particular stage you're looking at, the particular regions you're looking at, in how that particular switching will play out. So there is, first of all, we know that there has been, you know, I think we are now operating where somewhere in the region of 60 gigawatt of coal fire capacity being shot between now and uh, 2021. How much of the capacity is currently dispatched? It's a first degree of questions. Whether that capacity is in countries where the number one competitor is gas is a second degree of question. Uh, whether the capacity will just be um, substituted from renewable, you know, it, it's in, in other questions. So, um, I'm happy to get back to you with more granular you know, data that we do have, but the general picture that not all what gets switched from coal will be replaced by gas. And so renewable will take some of that part and some of the capacity closed simply will not be replaced because it's currently not running. And so when you do, do the math, the math is not you know, one goes down, one come up. It's actually one goes down, maybe it's currently not dispatched, and what it goes down partly will be replaced by renewables. So that's why um, we do have relatively stagnating uh, sort of uh, uh, demand growth between now and 2021. And if anything, I do think the risks are skewed to the downside of that sort of uh, stagnation. Uh, of course, you also had these huge base effects in 2015 that, uh, you know, um, it does give, you know, gas demand is starting from such a high level that might be indeed difficult to maintain uh, demand at that level. But overall, I think if we do consider the impact of renewables, if we do look a little bit at the regional um, dimension where capacity come down, um, and we do look at prices, uh, I think stagnating to declining gas demand in power between now and 2021 is the most likely outcome. Other questions? Yeah, there's one up here. Andy Anderson with uh, Energy Watch. Uh, a few of the power traders that I work with talking about a lot about uh, 
increased imports from the U.S. to uh, Mexico or increased exports to Mexico, roughly 20 BCF per day by uh, 2020 or so. I don't know if it's more specific to the United States, but interesting to see your perspective yeah. on Mexico's growing needs. I think uh, we generally agree with the idea of inputting to Mexico to go substantial, to grow substantially. Clearly, it's cheaper to import gas into Mexico at the current gas prices than um, <coughs> develop new gas resources in Mexico. There has been a number of, um, you know, auction and licensing around held in Mexico, mostly for oil. Uh, over the past year and a half. I think there is nothing on gas scheduled up to, 26, uh, to the end of this year. There may be something uh, uh, next year. So on the longer run, clearly the opening up of the Mexican sector, etc., will have an impact on domestic production growth. But in the outlook we are looking at, I think some this policy major positive policy changes that Mexico went through in their upstream sector might have limited impact on gas production growth. So either LNG or US gas, in fact, might be the easiest way to pull gas into Mexico. Um, the question really is how strong Mexican gas demand will be. So um, in recent years, in still through the early part of sort of the forecast, um, Mexico went through a lot of conversion of fuel fire power generation into gas fire power generation. So beyond the actual growth in power generation demand, there was a lot of conversion going on from fuel oil into gas. Once that is done, the question is really what the level of growth in um, electricity generation will be in Mexico, and to what extent renewable will start to play an important role into that, considering the very successful auction they had recently. I think most of the dynamics <coughs> is going to be a little bit more longer term compared to the outlook, so I would certainly agree that input from the U.S. into Mexico will increase strongly from now to 2021, but the impact of renewables and the actual level of growth in electricity demand are two things I will watch carefully, particularly when looking at 20. 2020, 2020 post. Here in the front row, Miles has a question. Hi, thank you. My name is Miles Mitchell. I'm a student at Columbia, and I uh, intern in private equity here. Private equity here in the city. I'm interested in trying to understand the relationship between um, going back to what you said about stranded assets, and I want to connect that to like economic development and progress. Um, I'm looking at, I'm, I'm drawing from the situation in Venezuela where there's obviously been an, an, a collapse in investment and output. And I want to get your sense of, in terms of like these managers now who have to deal with these large economies of scale that are diminishing, um, is the right outlook in terms of like the progress for these people, is it, is it that they should wait for the market to recover and get better and then at a certain price they'll turn on these um, Assets that are like the capacity has turned off, or long, or like in the in the longer term, are these investor are these managers um, thinking about repurposing those assets into like maybe like hydrogen economy or like what what's the relationship between like the yeah. I, 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 if I understand your questions, uh, talking for example the examples I made about uh, Algeria. Algeria has a lot of export capacity, both in terms of LNG and pipeline, which is currently not fully utilized. Now, of course, to what extent is not fully utilized because demand in Europe is not there, it's a question, but it's quite, it's quite likely that a good chunk of the underutilization is connected to the, um, the lack of, of feed gas. When I mean the lack of feed gas, I mean Algeria is not producing enough to actually meet both its demand growth, domestic demand growth, an expo market. So in that sense, it's what I define as trender because you have an asset that you paid for, which is currently not running, not because an economic choice, not because prices are below the marginal cost of running the plant, but simply because the feed gas is not there to feed the plant. And the lack of feed gas for that plant is a consequence of a number of issues. 
depending on the country you're looking at, the issues are different. I, I take Algeria, but there are a lot of other examples. Egypt is another example for areas which I perhaps know more than, than Venezuela. In Egypt as well, you had a lot of liquefaction capacity which was shut off because of the lack of production and feedstock. That is more of a long-term consequence of a number of things, fast demand growth, mostly in these countries due to very low administered prices. The lack of proper investment framework, which have discouraged investment, even in situation and in times where prices were actually quite high. So all that has led to suboptimal sub outcomes when it comes to maximization of resource and maximization of assets. So turning that around, of course, is possible, but not necessarily easy. And it's not just a matter of what the price is. It's also a matter of a lot of domestic policies and uh, regulation and framework and long-term visions. I don't know if that answers your questions. Okay. Antoine has a question. Constanza, I'm Hi. Antoine uh, Half from the center. Uh, <clears throat> two quick questions. Can you dig a little bit deeper in uh, your forecast for transport gas, both for uh, cars and also for other sectors like uh, bunkers? <clears throat> Uh, and both directly uh, as, uh, as gas, as fuel, or indirectly through power generation. And do you now, uh, is there now at the IEA a common share, a shared assumption for uh, EVs that's shared between the various medium-term reports? Uh, and can you talk a little bit more about the uh, efforts at achieving greater consistency across the medium-term reports. In the past, there was sometimes, you know, if you added all the forecasts of fuels from the various medium-term reports, you ended up with twice the amount of energy that you had in the wheel. So uh, where, where does that stand now? Well, uh, that's an interesting question coming from you, Antoine. <laughs> um, let me try to answer the first one. Um, in terms of transportation, um, we do have decent growth in transportation, meaning that it's still the set of the growth the fastest, uh, although it has been revised down as well. Uh, so um, again, as uh, it was in the previous report, the big majority of the increase come from the heavy duty vehicles, certainly the time frame I'm looking at, um, and in countries which already have a decent level of uh, gas in transport. Um, so we talk about China, and we talk about India, and we talk about some Latin American countries. Um, in terms of bunkering, I think uh, we, by 2021, uh, we do not expect that to make a huge difference to the numbers, might indeed grow fast, but in terms of actual volume uh, dispatched, it's still going to be relatively limited. I think the real prospect for that is post-2021. Um, so um, you can ask uh, the colleagues from the WIO when you will see them uh, what their numbers are for 2030. In terms of consistency uh, on, uh, on numbers, I think we are r quite consistent. Uh, I hope you remember from, uh, um, from your times, uh, but we you know, have common electricity generation forecast actually with, with uh, across the medium term outlook reports. Uh, we do have together, in fact, as you notice, I've talked a lot about renewables forecasts. Um, and we do, uh, in fact, have strong consistency, at least when it comes from gas, from the medium term to the WE as well. So I, I work very closely with a colleague from the World Energy Outlooks in terms of making sure that the medium term and the long term are consistent and, uh, and uh, close. Now, of course, it's also a question of methodologies. So the we or that run scenarios, assuming different things, we run forecasts. So it's the best outlook given the current level of information that we have and parameters that we use. So the, you shouldn't really expect them to be perfectly matching due to the differences in methodology, but certainly you should expect them to be consistent, and I think they are consistent. So I'm pretty happy where we stand on that. 
So we're at uh, <clears throat> 10 o'clock. I know there was at least one more question. I'm sorry, we didn't get to all of them. Um, but uh, we promised Costanza uh, we would wrap up uh, by now. And uh, there's a lot more to cover. We could have easily gone on for another hour or so. But hopefully you'll come back and join us today and continue to talk about uh, how the gas market is evolving and changing. Um, but that was a great presentation and discussion. Thank you for being here. And please join me in thanking Costanza Jacasio. Thank you. Thank you for having me.